I'd like to have you look back at the end of chapter 1 at verses 15 through 18. We're going to read those and then we'll hop into our new section this morning because it is a continuing train of thought. It says, This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. If you're just joining with us in our study through 2 Timothy, Paul the Apostle is writing this letter. He wrote it to his young protege, the man that he called his son in faith the one that would actually be taking over the responsibilities of Paul the Apostle in the church. And what a tremendous responsibility that would be. I mean, talk about being in over your head or having to follow in someone's footsteps that is just a a legend, if you will. And Paul, as he is in Rome, imprisoned, he's going to be standing before the Emperor Nero, he knows that he is in his final days of life. From church history, we know that eventually Paul would be put to death and executed uh, by the decree of Nero. And so we see this writing is very important, very important as we now head into verse 1 of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. So in light of these things that we just read in chapter 1, that everyone had forsaken him, that there were a couple close guys and they, they flew the coop. They weren't reliable. They were the ones that abandoned Paul in his time of need. There was one that remained faithful, one that remained strong, and that he did this huge thing of searching for Paul while he was imprisoned in Rome and ministered to Paul. Paul did not spare any details when it came to preparing Timothy for what was ahead for him. You know, oftentimes I think we have this tendency to sugarcoat the Christian life as if it's going to be this easy thing. And it's actually not. Being a Christian is a very difficult thing. You face challenges and you face discouragements and you have a constant, I would, I would think, in perpetuity, this, this constant opportunity to fall into sin or to ruin your relationship with the Lord, as it were, and to always always feel like there's something hounding you, which is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. When you decide that you want to follow the Lord and when you decide that you want to just not be a Christian in name but in actions as well, you will find that the enemy now sees you as a very viable threat, that you're no longer on the outside. You're no longer doing more damage for the kingdom of heaven, but you're actually doing damage now in the kingdom of darkness. You have decided to let your light shine. You have decided to stand upon biblical truth. You have decided to be bold and courageous, knowing that the Lord your God is with you wherever you shall go. And you find that there is a lot of opposition that will come your way. And you know, there's nothing worse than being walked into a situation not prepared. I have found myself, maybe you have, and I laugh about it now, though I wasn't laughing at the time, where I found myself unprepared, underprepared for what I was supposed to do. And it is a terrible feeling. Uh, You know, sometimes you direct that frustration towards the person that led you into that situation. And you think, why would you do that to me? How could you set me up like that? Often we'll find ourselves in a place where even if we think that we're prepared in our own strength, we realize how much more so we need the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus to do what he's called us to do. That is a hard place to be. But we all need to come to that realization. When Paul was writing to Timothy, he told him it was going to be hard. What you're going to be experiencing are things that you do not like. You are going to be faced with problems. You're going to be faced with discouragements. You're going to feel like quitting. 
You're going to feel like no one understands you. You're going to feel like you have no one that you can count on or rely upon. Paul, preparing Timothy for this work, says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. As a father to his son, Paul is speaking to Timothy, encouraging him in the Lord. And as I mentioned already, it's a very special thing that we're here reading today. I would liken it to me knowing if sometime in the future that my time on this earth was coming to a close and I was writing to my children. If I was writing to Hudson, saying, Hudson, these are the things that you need in order to survive, in order to succeed, in order to fulfill the calling that God has on your life. And when your time is short, your last moments of communication, you are putting down the most important things, the things that matter the most. And so I want you to know as you're reading the Bible today and as you're studying along, you're not just reading some random things. Oh yeah, the book of Timothy or whatever you might think it it may be. You're actually reading the final words of Paul the Apostle to a young man who is going to follow in his footsteps. You know, oftentimes you'll hear, well, hey, if you could go talk to your younger self, what would you tell him? Or what would you tell her? This is Paul as if he were talking to a younger version of himself. And he says, be strong, son. Be strong. Be strong in the grace of Jesus. Be strong. You're going to feel weak. You're going to feel discouraged. You're going to feel as if you can't go forward. But I need you to be strong. Be strong in the grace of Jesus. I wonder how many of us need to hear that today. Be strong in the grace of Jesus. If you think about it, if it were not for the grace of Jesus, we'd all be done for. We'd all be done for. If it were not for the the grace of God, we would not be able to be the men and women we've been created to be. If it were not for God's grace, we wouldn't be that husband or that wife or that father or that mother or that son or that daughter that we're supposed to be. If it were not for God's grace, quite frankly, I don't think any of us would be sitting here today. God's work His grace is at work in you right now. Whether you realize it or not, whether you feel it or sense it or not, Paul is telling Timothy that he must rely upon the grace of the Lord in order to accomplish what he needs to accomplish. Your fortitude, your resilience, your determination, your skill set will only take you so far. And if you want to be successful in being that man or that woman that God has created you to be, in fulfilling your ministry, fulfilling your calling, which every one of us have, you must rely on the grace of Jesus. I mean, I don't need to see a show of hands, but just by way of priming the pump of your intellect, how many of you are feeling overwhelmed by something today? How many of you have something that's daunting or hanging over your head? Maybe sitting in your seat this very moment with something going on in your life where all of a sudden you have had a very keen realization for your need for God's grace to help you, for God's grace to get you through it. Because we need God's grace, not just for ourselves, for our own spiritual survival, but we need it for our marriages, for our family, for our life, and for our ministry. And as Timothy would need an exceptional amount of the grace of Jesus, he was also to show an exceptional amount of that same grace to those he was ministering to. I don't know why it is it's very natural for us to, for some reason, it just, it must be our human nature because I think we all wrestle with this. It's very easy to point out our mistakes in somebody else's life. The things that bother us the most, the things that we say, how could that person do such an idiotic thing are the things that we do very regularly. But it just magnifies itself in somebody else's life. 
Maybe subconsciously, and I'm not here to psychoanalyze, you know, the inner workings of why we do things, but maybe it's because, you know, we, we don't like the things that are coming out of our life, and then we see them in someone else's life, and it reminds us of our shortcomings and our failures, and it upsets us. But I can tell you something, that if it's not for God's grace in my life, I would not be here today. And if we realize that it's God's grace at work in us that sustains us, we in return are to show that same grace to those that are around us, those that we're ministering to. And you don't have to be called a pastor to minister to someone. You could be called a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandfather, a friend. And we need the grace of God in our own lives in order to display that to somebody else to point them to Jesus. And, and you know, it may be fine. <laughs> you know, honestly, you know, thinking through these things that we're studying, it may be fine for us to receive God's grace. Oh, I love to receive God's grace myself. But it can't stop there. It must carry over. It must be imparted to those that are around us. I've been so quick to realize my need for God's grace and forgiveness but then, will I be as equally quick to grab someone by the throat and say, pay me what you owe, as Jesus described in Matthew 18? Lord, thank you for giving me a chance. Thank you for forgiving me, Lord. Thank you for showing me grace. I then in return need to impart that grace to those that have wronged me, those that have offended me, those that have sinned against me, why? Because the Lord forgave my debt, which was far greater than I could ever repay, so I must in return comparatively forgive that person who owes me five bucks when I owed the Lord 50 trillion, and he forgave me. So this grace at work in Timothy's life must be imparted to others for the ministry of the gospel and the teaching of God's word, listen to this, this is for all of us. The ministry of the gospel and the teaching of the word of God is not to be hoarded. It's not to be kept to ourself. It's to be shared. The things that the Lord has done in your life, you're then now to share that with other people. The things that you've experienced through the grace of God at work in you, you are then now able to minister to other people with what you've received. The Bible even talks about even comforting those with the same comfort that you've been comforted by God with. Not to just keep it to ourselves. It's a tremendous gift to receive the grace of the Lord. And so this leads us to that first characteristic that I'm going to have you, we're only going to look at one today, but this first characteristic is one of good stewardship. Stewardship. So when you think of stewardship, I want us to all be on the same page. I mean, you can look up the definition and you could find an exact description of what that word means, but for all intents and purposes today, stewardship means I've been entrusted with something that belonged to God. I have been given responsibility to manage something that does not belong to me. I don't own it, and I did nothing to receive it. It was something that God gave me through his grace. Stewardship. We are all stewards of something that does not belong to us. The owner, in this case the Lord, gives us now the power to steward properly to be a good steward of the things that God has given us. I can tell you on a personal note, stewardship is something that is very important to me. Because God, and those of you that know me personally know that God has given me a lot of grace. He really has. He has given me the grace to accomplish what he's called me to accomplish. And those of you that are here that are involved with the work of the ministry here at Vision City Church, you have been given that same grace as well. For those of you that are desiring to follow the Lord and you're seeking him as that man or woman of Christ, God has given you grace and the power to do so and to steward the gifts that he has given you. We're called to be faithful stewards with what God has entrusted us with. 
Too often I think we act like we own it. Oh, look what I did. Look how I obtained. Look what I have done. And really, if you want to succeed in the world, you have to be self-promotional. You have to be the one that, you know, talks about your achievements and your attributes and your accomplishments and your resources and all of these things. That's the natural man. When you come to a personal relationship with Jesus, you realize that there is not one thing that we have that we have not been given by the Lord. Everything. Well, it was my idea, you know, to start this company. So how are you going to try to tell me that that wasn't me? Well, who gave you the brain to think of your idea? That was the Lord. Who gave you the wherewithal to carry those ideas out? It was the Lord. And each of us, each of us, and I know we use this term very broadly. And we think, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I guess in some way, shape, or form, I have some ministry that I'm called to. But listen to me carefully. Every single one of you that are here today, the Lord has a calling upon your life to fulfill a ministry. A ministry. Something that the Lord is entrusting you with to be able to bring him glory and to reach those that are hurting or are in need of a touch from their Savior. Every one of you. It's not just, oh yeah, Garrett has a calling on his life to be a pastor. Well, yeah, that's true. That is my calling. That's what I'm to be doing. But that does not mean that that is the only calling in the church. Stewardship. The things that the Lord has entrusted us with. This ministry that the Lord has given you, some of you may not even know what it is yet. Some of you are like, I, I, I wonder if I am called to, to pastor. What if I'm supposed to be a Bible teacher? I mean, wow. I mean, if, if Garrett can teach the Bible, anyone can teach the Bible, I could be called to do that. I'll do it. Great. You know, we have people that have the gift of the hospitality, and they're the most welcoming people I've ever met. You'll even meet some of them at the little hospitality table in the back. We have some great guys that are hard workers that help people that are in need. They do practical things. We have people that are blessed with tremendous resources and they help people that are hurting. We are the body of Christ. And the ministry that God has given each of us is not something that we're to keep to ourselves, but rather we are stewards of something that belongs to God. And we're to be faithful stewards with what God has entrusted us with. And as you recognize that you're a steward of everything that you have and that all that you have has been given to you by God, you find that now your perspective on life changes. You start to have a looser grip on things in this world. Things that used to stress you out and things that used to burden you. You realize I am stewarding something that doesn't belong to me. I own nothing and I will take nothing with me after I die. What are you talking about? I own my house. I own my car. I own my clothes. I own some Real estate. I don't, listen, you're not taking anything with you. But for the time being that we're here on this earth, we are entrusted with great grace from God, with a ministry. We're entrusted with things that the Lord has given us. And so when we treat those things as gifts from God, we, number one, become thankful instead of unthankful. Number two, we are more free to use those things for the glory of God. We're more free to use those things to help people that are in need and even to use those things to store up treasures in heaven. My perspective changes. All that I have has been given to me by the Lord and even what I give back to the Lord, even as Pastor Steve shared, one of the ways that we Worship the Lord is through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Even when we give to the Lord, we are taking out of his hand and then putting it back in there and saying, Lord, I'm going to give you my money. 
And he says, well, actually, I gave it to you, and so thank you for giving it back to me. I don't know exactly how that works. And so we realize that even the things that we offer back to the Lord, our time, our talents, our treasures, whatever it may be, those things were given to us to steward by the Lord in the first place. And so we pass on what God has given to us. That's why for those of you that have children, why we're to train up our children, why we're to minister to our spouse, that's a ministry to your children, to your husband, to your wife. That's a ministry. That's a special calling of the Lord. That's my first ministry. Because I love you guys, but if I had to choose between my first ministry and you guys, it was nice knowing you. Our family, our children. Because we need to be able to raise up other future leaders who have hearts that are right before the Lord. And so as a steward, and as I said, this is something that's very important to me. Because especially in this area, there can be a lot of comparison. There can be a lot of competition. Even amongst churches and pastors and things that you would say, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. Well, it's because it is. And there can be this pressure that's placed upon people to, you know, provide certain things or to have certain things. And you know what? It's neither here nor there for me. I steward what God has entrusted me with. The team of leaders at this church are good stewards with what God has given them responsibility over. And what the Lord gives another one of his servants is not related to what he gives us. We are to be found faithful stewards. And so we'll take that macro level and then take it down to the micro for you and your family. What the Lord has entrusted someone else with may not be the same that he entrusts you with. But you're not called to steward somebody else's responsibility. You're called to steward what God has entrusted you with. How small or how large or how in between that may be. And it does not matter what somebody else is doing. You be faithful in stewarding what God has given you. Because when it comes down to it, as much as we like to compare ourselves, and it's hard with social media and a lot of people with their highlight reels and, hey, we're going here and doing that and we got this going on and we're like, well, I'm not there and I'm not doing that and I don't have that either, you know, so my life must be terrible. You know, it's very easy to question God's will or God's plan. I mean, have you ever wondered, you're like, Lord, what's wrong? Why are you blessing them so much? What about me, Lord? Lord, how come you're providing for them, but right now I'm struggling? Or Lord, how come it seems like their life is so easy and mine is so hard? Who are we to question the will of the Lord or his plan? You know, in street slang, we just say, how about you do you? How about you be responsible for what God has given you to be responsible with and let the Lord take care of them? We have no idea what's going on in their lives. We have no idea what's going on in their family. But what we do have control over or responsibility of is what's happening in our family and in our life and what God has entrusted us with. So who am I to try to tell the Lord what we think should be happening or what I should be given stewardship of? Come on, Lord. Are we only going to be faithful stewards of the things that we think are grand enough or worth stewarding? Well, Jesus said, and I'd like to read this to you. It's 10 verses. It's in Matthew 25. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Jesus continues to share the story in verse 16 of Matthew 25, and it says, Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received the two gained two more also. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. 
I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The one that I'm not reading to you is the one who buried his talent. Didn't do anything with it. And when his master returned, he said, you unfaithful servant. And he cast him out. But the point that I'm trying to draw today is between the man that had five and the man that had two. There are different levels of stewardship. But listen to me very clearly. Listen to me carefully because I'm going to tell you this very clearly. Yes, there are different levels of stewardship, but faithfulness is all that the Lord requires. For me, I would think that five talents was a much greater stewardship opportunity than just having two talents. I mean, that's more than double my talent. The two-talent guy must have thought to himself, wow, he gave that guy five and he only gave me two. He's got a greater responsibility. I guess mine's not that, that great. You know, it's kind of small. But let me ask you a question. Did the steward with five talents turn to ten receive greater accolades from his master than the two talents turned to four? You see one guy with this massive stewardship and you got this other guy with a small tiny one. There's got to be this different, you know, tier uh, of, uh, of rewards, right? No, absolutely not. Jesus himself made no distinction guess what? They each received the same commendation, which was, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And so as you sit here today, and maybe you've had a problem with drawing comparisons between your stewardship and somebody else's stewardship, understand that the only thing that our master our Lord and Savior, our Heavenly Father requires of us is faithfulness. Be a good steward with whatever he has entrusted you with. And so Timothy, as we come back to our text this morning, he was a recipient of God's grace and he was to be a dispenser of it as well. He wasn't to hoard what God had entrusted him with, but rather he was to maximize the investment that God had given him. That's why we read now in verse two. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is stewardship. Good stewards of God's gifts invest what God has given them in such a way that there is a compound interest. You know, it's been said, you train your children, you're training your grandchildren. Because what you do with your responsibility will help that person do with their responsibility. There's a compounding effect. The same applies for ministry and spiritual stewardship. It is so nice to know, isn't it, that the work that we do for the Lord is never in vain? Because others may judge it. Man, that guy is a failure. I don't think anything good came out of that. Nobody showed up for the event. Nobody got saved, quote unquote. They didn't come forward. That doesn't matter to the Lord. It matters to us because we like to gauge whether something was successful or, you know, whether we should feel good about this or what others might think about us if, you know, the optics of whatever it is. The Lord doesn't care about those things at all. He cares about our faithfulness and our obedience to him. 
It has never been about our results. See, life in this world, in the world in the secular sense, it's always result-oriented. Hey, you, you, you got to, you know, produce. You know, in sports, like, hey, man, you better be scoring touchdowns. You better be scoring points. You know, in academia, you better be getting the grades. You better be writing the books. You better be, you know, producing. When it comes to spiritual stewardship, faithfulness and obedience are the two most important things. Because we serve the Lord, not man. Everything that we do in the name of Jesus will last for eternity as we do it unto the Lord. Everything that we do that is even unnoticed by those around us for the Lord will last for eternity. It's not if somebody gives you an attaboy or a pat on the back or you're doing a good job or I really notice, you know, how great that has been because people don't typically do that. We're critical by nature. Ah, uh, guess it didn't go too well today, did it? Oh, man, guess we fell a little short today of our goal. And, and, and when it comes to spiritual things, we can't judge righteously with human judgment. In God's economy, it's completely different. What is valuable, what is of worth, are things that typically we despise. And so we gotta be careful that we don't allow a secular worldview to creep into our lives pertaining to spiritual things. Because I'll tell you, man didn't call you Man didn't empower you. It was all the Lord. So serve the Lord out of obedience and wisdom, not fearing man or caring for man's opinion. Paul said the fear of man brings a snare. And there are too many Christians today that are too worried about what other people may think or say. They look for man's approval and not God's approval. It doesn't matter if people think whatever they're going to think about you. And it doesn't mean that you turn into a jerk and you can care less kind of thing where I, you know, yeah, why well, don't you take a run and jump or whatever it might be. You know how, how we can be cold hearted and that's not what he's saying. It's not what the Bible teaches. And I think we all understand that. And I think we also understand the power that other people's opinions can have over us. People don't know about your marriage. People don't know about what's happening in your family. They're on the outside. People don't know about your ministry. They might want to, you know, gauge whatever they want to, you know, use as, as maybe a metric for determining whether this is something that's good or not. Listen, let it go. Let it go. We desire to please the Lord who entrusted us with this special gift of his grace. For me, as a personal example, as a pastor, I'm to be found faithful in stewarding Vision City Church. Not somebody else's church. Could have been in a lot of different churches. But this is where God called me to be. And he said, Garrett, I want you to steward this. The other leaders of this church, guys, I want you to steward this church in the city of Irvine. You know, back when we were meeting outside in a field and people were having allergies and there's, you know, goose droppings everywhere and stuff, and you're like going, oh my goodness gracious. Lord, couldn't I be stewarding the other church, Lord? Somebody, you know, may have been like, I think I'm going to look for another steward elsewhere. I don't blame you. I get it. What if the Lord said, hey, Garrett, I want you to steward a group of people in a field for a year. Oh, Lord, that's, that's that guy's job. No, what a privilege. Are we going to be the type of people who are like, hey, you know, give that to somebody else? No, what a great honor and privilege for us to be able to call this church our home. For the men and women that lead this church so amazingly well, to be able to be faithful in stewarding what God has entrusted them with. What an amazing thing that we can come and study God's word 
to be able to steward in such a way that we teach God's word simply and that we raise up others to do so. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, Paul writes and says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored, he says, more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was within me. It's the grace of God that has enabled us to still be married, huh? To still be parents, huh? To still be employees or employers, to still be friends. It's by God's grace that we are what we are. And as God's grace works in us and through our lives, we leave the outcomes to him. And guess what? As we leave the outcomes, which is the complete opposite, because we're always stressed about outcomes. Boy, there better be a very high ROI. There better be a good return on this investment. God's not asking you to bring the return. He's asking you to bring your heart, your obedience, and your faithfulness. And so we leave the outcomes to the Lord, but then simple obedience and childlike faith falls upon us. And through obedience, we find the foundation for faithful stewardship. And we want to raise up others that are faithful and obedient to the Lord, that are able to teach others from God's word. And that's what's happening even here. As the Lord has had his hand upon this church since day one, As the Lord has walked us through the valleys of shadow and death, he has led us on the paths of righteousness. He has enabled us to endure great difficulties. And many of us have walked with each other through all of those things. And somehow the Lord has taken something when there was absolutely nothing and he has created a living church. A group of people who are brothers and sisters in Christ, who are here for each other. We might even call ourselves friends. We might even like each other. Man, what a novel thing that is in church. We are the family, the people. And every one of us have been given something by the Lord to steward. And it's unique to you. It's not about the other people. It's not about them. It's about you. Sometimes we think, well, you know, if I have a greater opportunity or more responsibility, then I'll do a good job. But the Lord is saying, be faithful over few things. A few things be faithful with. And then I'll add to that. Take what you have been given and maximize it. Be faithful as a husband or a wife. Be faithful as a mother or a father. As a grandmother. As a friend. As a Christian. Be faithful in those things. And those are things that you actually have control over. Those are the things that you've actually been given like the green light to steward faithfully. You know, some of us wrestle with fear and so we have to control everything. This is not what I'm talking about. I got to micromanage every every single thing of, you know, my surroundings so that I can feel some sort of peace. No, the peace that comes from God is not conditional upon whether or not you have everything floating around your life under control. Some of us want to abdicate responsibility. That's somebody else's job. Or I'm not being faithful as a steward. I'm taking what God entrusted me with and I'm burying it. I'm ignoring it. I'm neglecting it. And that is wrong. That is wrong. That is wrong before the Lord. And we do not want to be those men or women that take what God has entrusted us with and hoard it or hide it. Or neglect it. Rather the opposite. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, stir up the gift that's within you. 
Exercise it. Use it. Be faithful with it. Pour into those that you've been entrusted with care over. Use what God has given you for his glory. And be a steward in such a way that somebody can take what you have given them and then run with it. In a back book, it says, write the vision down. Make it clear so that he who reads it may run with it. What does that mean for us today? It means that you should be living, that we should be living in such a way, communicating in such a way, treating others in such a way, stewarding in such a way, that those that we're responsible over will take what we've entrusted with them and be able to take it to the next level, to take it and pass it on to someone else. This is the compound effect of godly stewardship that comes from the two simple things of faithfulness and obedience to what God has given you. Regardless of how big or small, how seemingly insignificant or grandiose, be faithful. And so Paul writes to Timothy, be strong in the grace of Jesus Christ. Be strong in him. You're not going to be able to handle what is coming unless you're strong in the grace of the Lord. Paul knew. He experienced it. He wrestled with it through his entire ministry. He knew that it was not going to be easy. He was not going to sugarcoat anything, but he told him the things that he need, needed. And those are the things that we need today. Each of us, myself included, we need to be strong in the grace of Jesus in order to be the stewards that we're called to be. And so I wonder, as I often think about you guys, And what you have going on. What you wrestle with. What you feel discouraged by. Are you just completely blowing it? Or are you being faithful? We all make mistakes. We all fall short. We are all imperfect. But that's not an excuse to continue on that path. It should serve as an impetus to step up our game, so to speak. To be a better husband or a better wife, a better father or a better mother, a better son or a better daughter, a better follower of Jesus. You may have come in here today have fallen, having fallen smack right on your face. I'm so glad that you're here today so that the Lord might encourage you and remind you that he has given you his great grace. He's called you to steward something that is very important. It might even be the person that's sitting next to you or those little ones that are checked into class. It's not insignificant. It didn't matter if there was five and 10 or two and four. Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So may we be found faithful. May we come to a resolution, maybe even this morning, that, you know, there's some areas in my life that I can tighten up. There are some things that I can do a better job with. And I'm going to start today. And what a great opportunity it is, even on the first Sunday of this month, as we observe uh, communion on the first Sunday of each month, to be reminded of how it is all made possible. How all what is made possible? You being able to steward what God's given you. It's the grace of God that was demonstrated on the cross when Jesus laid down his life for the sins of the world. 
that through faith in him, regardless of what you have done or where you have been or the mistakes that you have made or the, uh, just the, the filth of this world that has accumulated on your account, you might be forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. And what a great thing that is. And Father in heaven, we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit that was accomplished today through your living word. We ask, Father, that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, that you would give us fresh vision, Lord, for what you have called us to do with that which we have been given to steward. We ask, Lord, that we be found faithful servants. We ask, Lord, that our hearts would be loyal to you. And so, Lord, as we close out this morning's worship service with a song of praise, thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. I pray that you would fill us afresh with your joy and with your love and give us your strength that we need to do what you've called us to do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you today. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.